Well, praise the Lord there. I'm Bishop J. Delano Ellis II, and I am the Metropolitan Archbishop for the Joint College of African American Pentecostal Bishops. This is a video presentation on the history and background of the college, a little bit about me, where I came from, and some other wonderful people attached to this college. Sit back, look at it, enjoy it, enjoy it. Laugh when we laugh. It ain't that serious. And uh, get in touch with us. We'll look to see you at some time or another. Twenty-five years ago, this year, the late Bishop Wilbert Sterling McKinley, Bill McKinley, Bishop Roy Edmund Brown, myself and Prophet Bernard E. Bernard Jordan were in a car together traveling from New York to Philadelphia. We were going to get vestments for another conference we were going to attend. And Bishop McKinley was commiserating about all these junk food bishops being created and nobody, <laughs> nobody knew why, no rhyme, no reason. And we need to organize an academy to teach them. I said to Bishop McKinley, don't criticize them until you give them a chance to try on your moccasins. Well, in truth, he said, there's no such thing as a training academy. A bishop becomes a bishop and he makes mistakes until he either falls flat on his face or finally gets up bruised and scarred and makes something of himself. I said, why does that have to be? You train young priests to be ministers and how to be preachers and how to be celebrants of the celebrations of our redemption. Why can't we do that for people who enter the bishopric? tell them how it's done. He said, let's organize. Let's put together an academy. Let's call a class. I said, let's call Paul Morton. And we talked to him on the speaker in the car about what we were doing. Yes, let's do it. I need somebody to help me train my bishops. And so we planned it. Those leaders were already busy and they asked me to organize it and serve as its first president. And so from an automobile election till today, I've been serving as the president. Some of my earlier challenges were believability. I'm 73 years old now. 25 years ago would make me in my 50s. That's young. As a young man, a young preacher, telling these old gray-haired bishops what's appropriate, what they should wear, what they shouldn't wear, and how they should act and how they shouldn't act. Archbishop McKinley, even though he nominated me to be president, and said that I had more energy and leg agility to get the college off the ground. We turned around and asked him to serve as the first metropolitan of the college. Now metropolitan is, is the honorary title for senior among all of us. Bishop Wilbur Sterling McKinley, 
Oh my goodness, one of the smartest men that I can think of, uh, you know, besides my husband, of course. But Bishop McKinley had an understanding of the word and, and, a, and a way to express that to us that was so mind blowing. It is you that's, you walk away trying to understand how did he come to that. Uh, Bishop Brown is a lot of fun. He is comical. He is intense, intensely in love with Jesus and with the things of God. He wants to be right. He wants his fellowship to be right. That's the kind of person he is. And uh, I wish you had known him 25 years ago uh, to go to Pilgrim Church in New York. That was the church to go to. Bishop Roy Brown uh, is loved by so many. And Bishop Roy Brown has been like a brother uh, uh, to my husband, which makes him a brother to me. We've known him for over 30 years. Well, 30 for me, more than that for Bishop. Um, but his, his belief in what, is, what we're doing with the college is meaningful. He's, he was a founder and his, his support even in his uh, bouts with his health and all of that, um, just knowing that he's there and still praying for us. And even the last few years, we've sent him so much stuff from the college to keep him connected in some way. Bishop Morton was a supporter, sent his bishops, his candidates, but he's one of the founders. And there's no need in throwing his memory out because he's not present. Bishop Morton is, in, in many ways, a, like distant family. And um, I've known him uh, most of my life. And him being a part of the college in any way, even if it's just the history of the college, that's still significant. Um, because he allowed his bishops from, a, from an early start in his organization, in his reformation, to be a part of something else that was new. Let me tell you what the 25 years means to me. It means stability, that it has lasted. Because when it's right, when it's good, it will last. Bishop E. Bernard Jordan did not make any contributions in the early days because he was just a rider in the car. Yeah, he was just, he was just in there for the ride going to get him a new cassock. He was close friends with Bishop Brown. He's a good, clear clarion voice. He's prophetic. He operates in the prophetic and that, that's, that was his only contribution. He's there now more as an armor bearer and an assistant to Archbishop Roy Brown. Bishop Blake uh, came on board, has supported for several years with finance, um, a, an annual grant to the college to help underwrite the work of the college. He's been to the college. In the early years, Bishop Blake came and taught when we were holding our sessions at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, Bishop Blake has been here to preach for the annual session. Uh, he's been the conference preacher, but you know, he gives as good as he gets. Um, his offering has been very generous to us. There is the vice president for Help Meets, which is Dr. Sabrina Ellis, my wife, has been since the college was founded. I asked her to develop a program for help meets. In those formative years, although I had the, the role, uh, the title, and even the authority, if you will, to, to lead the women, I was not really sure of myself. And so in the beginning years, I relied on other women. I would, I would set the structure up, but I would rely on other women to come in. Um, early your years, it was Dr. Wanda Turner who would come every year and 
then uh, Dr. Susie Owens, you know, known throughout the country, you know, as co-pastor, but I relied heavily on them to do much of the teaching uh, while I did the administrative or the planning, and it was good. It's always been good from the very beginning for the help meets so that, that when they leave the conference, they leave the college, they also feel as if they've gotten something to go home with. Proper protocol or dress for bishops and clergy alike is always black in public. Transportation, travel, on the bus, driving from one city to another, flying from one place to another. Never purple, never scarlet. If we are invited to visit with our brothers uh, in the Roman church, it is black. We should wear black regardless to our rank within our denomination, we wear black. When we are visiting another jurisdiction within our faith group, it is improper to wear anything but black unless you're invited to wear purple with the, the host bishop. You never outdress or equally dress your host, your gracious host. In Christian art, there is a bird that is used often. We know about the eagle, we know about the dove, the dove representing the Holy Ghost, the eagle representing uh, God Almighty, John's Gospel. But the other bird that we seldom mention is the pelican. And the next time you look at your more liturgical churches, stained glass windows, the artwork, look for the pelican sitting over her nest of birds. The pelican is white except her breast. Her breast is red. And that symbolism tells the story. The pelican, in time of hunger and famine, bites her own breast and takes her flesh out to feed her young. They eat of her flesh. The bishop is the symbol of self-sacrifice. I die piece by piece that the flock might live. That's what that red breast is. This is not a piece of jewelry. It's not, it's not a display. It's a symbol of slavery. I'm a prisoner. I'm chained to the cross. You don't see my cross on my suit, but you see the chain. It represents servitude to the one who hung on the cross. That's God's call to you. And it's his call for you to prepare, not go take a revival, just prepare for ministry, for a life of gospel ministry. And I asked him, will you teach me? He said, I'll teach you everything I know for as long as I can. I said, fair enough. And that's how I began studying and preparing for ministry. I lived in his house. I slept on the floor next to him when he would prepare his sermon on Saturday, my day was in the room with him in the library. And what he would say, I would write. And then I learned to type. And my typing 
was the seek and ye shall find method. Two fingers, hunt and pick. But I would type Papa sermons. And you know, you didn't have backup and erase. You had to erase or use the whiteout. So you couldn't make a lot of mistakes. But he would preach what I wrote because I wrote what he said. And that's how I learned to develop sermons, find what he wanted me to find in the pulpit commentary. Nobody buys pulpit commentary today. I have a set at home. But pulpit commentary, find out what was intended by a certain text. Read it to me. What did it say? And I'd read it. I, you know, for a long time I thought he couldn't read because he made me read everything. And I'd read it to him. Ah, ah, that's it. Uh -huh. Take that sentence right there, that parenthetical section, and I'd type it into his sermon notes. And that's how I began to prepare. And I developed a hunger for knowledge. I see it as one of my lifelong jobs to say to our preachers, Calm down, go home, sit down, play with your kids, play with your wife, play, be normal. And you say, but Bishop, every time I see you, you're in a clergy. That's all right, you mind your business. I can get more playing in this collar <laughs> than you can in a jogging suit. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this. I laughed. I hope you laughed. I know the director laughed. He kept me laughing. He cracked it up in a split second. But he's a wonderful guy, isn't he? I want you to be blessed. Get in touch with us. Spread the word about us. And I'm sure you'll be helped. And so will your offspring in holiness. Have a good day.